Listen carefully and answer questions one to five. Good morning, Ace Accommodation. Who am I speaking to? Sylvia McKinley. Thank you. And your first name is Sylvia. Yes, that's S Y L V I A. Can you tell me what country you live in? Of course, it's England, actually. I thought so. Now, when are you coming? Well, at the moment we're planning on arriving on July the twenty-sixth. Oh, the twenty-fifth. That's the last day of the public holiday. And it might be difficult to find something available on that date. No, we're coming on the twenty-sixth of July. Oh, well, that's fine then. How many of you will there be? Just my sister and myself. And how long do you intend to stay? Oh, only a couple of weeks. We'd like to stay longer, but we'll have to get back to work. So you're not coming on business then? No, it's just a holiday. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions six to ten. Good. Now, what exactly are you looking for? A house, a duplex, or an apartment? I think an apartment will suit us just fine. And how many bedrooms? Two. One or two. It depends on the size. And car parking. Will you require a lock-up garage? They're a little harder to find with an apartment. We'll have a higher car, and as far as I know, there are no regulations concerning car parking. I think as long as it's not parked on the street and it's secure, there shouldn't be any problems. Okay. Now, I'm assuming you want something by the beach. Yes, that's the idea. We want to enjoy the surf, sand, and sunshine. Okay. Do you want to be close to a shopping mall or the casino or the fun parks? No, none of that really matters to us. But we'd like to have reasonable access to the motorway so that we can drive up to Brisbane to visit friends there. Well, there are quite a few lovely small towns to choose from. There's Main Beach, which is north of Surfers Paradise, or Mermaid Waters. Which is a bit further south, or Palm Beach, which is quite a bit further south. Mermaid Waters sounds delightful. Is it close to the motorway? Well, not really. The M1 is actually closest to Palm Beach, and prices are likely to be more reasonable there too. That's settled then. Palm Beach, it is. Now, if you'll just give me your email address. Well. My email is s m a c thirteen at hotmail dot com. How much are you looking to spend per week on accommodation? Could we get something clean, comfortable, and reasonable for twelve hundred dollars a week? Could you stretch that to fifteen hundred a week? I've got a property in mind that you'll absolutely love, but you'd have to go to fifteen hundred. Twelve hundred wouldn't cover it. All right then, but that's our top limit. Good. That is the end of section one. Now turn to section two. First, you have some time to look at questions eleven to fourteen. I'll start by telling you a little bit about the history of the club and all that it can offer, and there will be a chance for you to ask questions over tea and coffee in the lobby afterwards. You'll also be able to pick up pamphlets from the table at the back of the hall, and if you wish to purchase any of our products, Bill will serve you at the front counter. As most of you probably know, the club was founded by Nick Noble about thirty years ago. He thought of placing an advertisement in the local newspaper, or erecting a billboard somewhere, 
but it was the radio that he decided on to reach the most people. You know, other people who might be interested in outdoor pursuits. Nick was overwhelmed by the response he got, and the club soon grew from a dozen or so friends and enthusiasts to around 200 members 20 years ago, and steadily since then to reach a membership of over 2,500 now. You don't have to be a hardened athlete or extreme adventurer. On the contrary, it's a group that encourages friendship and fellowship through social and recreational activities. The club tries to cater for all levels of maturity and both genders. In fact, anyone who has the physical ability and a moderate level of health and fitness to participate in open-air activity on a regular basis. I think our youngest member is a five-year-old boy and our oldest member is a 75-year-old man. And there will always be something for those families with small children. More about that later. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 15 to 20. OK, now going back to the grades of activity, first of all, tramping. This is very popular with singles and couples without children, but is certainly not restricted to those groups. Tramping is arranged for Tuesdays and Saturdays throughout the year. Most tramps are of a duration of three to five hours, depending on the weather and the terrain, and of course the time of year. And if you wish to participate, Phone the coordinator who can give you more information. I'll move on now to walking, which is very popular with families, but open to everyone. And walks are arranged for every Thursday and every Sunday over the course of the entire year. Walks last no more than three hours, and get in touch with the walking organiser to confirm your participation. Now, the Wanderers are what you might call a subgroup of the Active Outdoor Club. This group was set up to cater for the less active, more elderly, or families with very young children who still want to enjoy the great outdoors, but without quite so much exertion. Bear in mind that the length of these activities is variable, but we're always home before dark. Any member of the club is welcome to join in their activities on a Sunday. If you'd like to see what the Wanderers are up to, check the website and then phone the leader for more information. But before I finish, I really must mention something that can be a lot of fun. These are our mystery weekends. The committee puts a lot of time and effort into the organisation of these weekends away. There will be a charge to cover travel and accommodation costs, but apart from that, it's an affordable and exciting weekend away from the city. For more information, call the chairman of the committee. You'll find his phone number in the newsletter. That is the end of Section 2. Now turn to Section 3. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 26. Come in and take a seat. Thank you. Now, you've made an appointment to see me with regard to one of the papers you want to enrol next semester. Yes, that's right. It's the Globalisation and Educational Change paper, GEC 692. Ah, well, I know the one you mean, but all the code numbers are going to change next semester, so although the course name will stay the same, the code will be ED995. But the content will be the same, right? Oh, yes, to a large extent. The objectives are still to provide you with the skills and knowledge for analysing the challenges 
that globalization poses for education. Yes, that's what I'm really interested in. The future of education. Not where we are now, but where we're heading. Well, you'll most likely enjoy the course because it'll give you the opportunity not just to explore, but also to document the advancement of new educational developments. And there'll be quite a lot of analysis involved. Yes, obviously. But once you've examined how education has been affected by cultural values and socio-economic structures, you'll go on to debate the pros and cons of the restructuring of public education in view of rapid globalization. I see. But when you say public education, do you mean worldwide? No, no. That would be far too large an undertaking for just one paper. You'd probably choose to work with the education system within your own state or country. Sounds interesting, but isn't it a bit restrictive? Not at all. From there, you'd move on to explore the impact of internationalization on curriculum diversity in both developing and developed countries. Have you had a chance to look at the assessment criteria yet? Actually, I have. And it makes me a bit nervous just thinking about it. Why is that? Well, I see that the first assignment starts with an illustrated PowerPoint presentation to the rest of the class. I've never done one before. No need to worry. You can get help with that. Anyway, this presentation isn't graded. It's what we call a formative assessment. The feedback you get will help you to finalize the written review. That's a review of those academic articles in the first part of the reading list, right? Yes, but you only have to choose five of them. That first assignment is worth thirty percent. And the second assignment? There are two parts to that also, and both are graded. Twenty marks will go towards your participation in a seminar, and then there's a five thousand word essay, which will be graded out of fifty. Thanks. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions twenty-seven to thirty. Is there anything else I can help you with? The reading list is quite long. Where do you think I should start? You could start with this one by Tower here at the bottom of the page. Sorry, who? Tower, T O W E R, two thousand and seven, Comparative Education. That should give you a good basis. Then move on to Elliot, Educational Issues of the New Millennium. But be sure to get the two thousand and eight edition, not the original nineteen ninety eight edition. Okay, so that's Tower first, then Elliot. I think I could handle a couple more over the summer break. Well, in that case, look for Brown's Education and Globalization, published in two thousand and nine, and I'd also really recommend this one here, Globalization and Knowledge Policy by York, published quite recently, in fact, two thousand and ten. That is the end of section three. Now turn to section four. First, you have some time to look at questions thirty-one to forty. Good afternoon, and thank you for your warm welcome. Could I start by asking for a show of hands? How many of you have had a flu vaccination at the beginning of winter? Hmm, I thought so. You young ones always think you're indestructible. Well, as you are no doubt aware, disease-spreading germs or pathogens are everywhere. On a daily basis, the human body has to ward off attacks by various harmful bacteria and viruses. A healthy body has a good defense system against many of these germs, 
but the defense only operates well against microorganisms that it has already encountered, in which case it is said to be immune. There are two ways in which humans acquire natural immunity. Actively, when a person has first suffered and then recovered from an illness, and passively, when ready-made protection is transferred into the body, for example, from the maternal blood via the umbilical cord to an unborn child, or through breast milk. Now, artificially acquired immunity can help the body to fight disease, so we can use active immunization as a preventative measure. This is when a person is vaccinated against an illness by injection or oral ingestion of a tiny amount of weakened or inactive germs, not enough to actually cause him or her to contract the illness, but sufficient for the body's defense system to recognize and respond to the threat by forming antibodies. Intervention using passive immunization, on the other hand, is a method of curing an illness after it is too late for prevention. It is less effective than active immunization and takes longer to work. It is used when the body has already been invaded by bacteria and the person is ill. In this case, there is no time for the body to make antibodies of its own, so proteins, usually taken from the blood of animals, are injected to equip the patient with the essential antibodies to combat the particular illness. Let's have a quick look at a bit of history. The discovery of vaccination to boost the body's immune system by making it sensitive to particular disease-causing bacteria was made by an 18th century English doctor called Edward Jenner. He noticed that survivors of smallpox, a common but extremely dangerous disease, never contracted the disease a second time. In other words, they were immune. He studied a similar disease in cows called cowpox and realized that people in contact with the infected cows became ill with symptoms resembling smallpox. However, this disease was quite mild by comparison and those who contracted cowpox were then immune to smallpox. He conducted an experiment by injecting a child with a small amount of pus taken from a cowpox pustule. The child subsequently became ill, but soon recovered. Later, he injected the child with pus from a smallpox pustule, and the child did not get sick. He had developed immunity to the more dangerous disease. The antibodies produced to fight the cowpox bacteria had been able to fight off the smallpox bacteria. What are antibodies? Well, Antibodies are made by white blood cells called B lymphocytes, and this is done in response to the presence of antigens or other bacterial toxins which have been released by the microorganisms, what we commonly refer to as germs, that have invaded the body. These Y-shaped antibodies, or you can think of them as antitoxins, may stop the toxins or repair the damage they have done by what is known as the antigen antibody reaction which takes place within the plasma of the blood a correct antibody for that disease clings to a particular antigen in order to render it harmless large numbers of these pairs clump together to form a bigger unit this is called agglutination and is able to be seen by the naked eye which is very helpful for doctors and other specialists to determine which illnesses a patient is immune to Inoculation or active vaccination can protect people from serious diseases. The vaccine may make a person feel unwell for a few days when the immune system starts to produce antibodies to match the introduced antigen. This is called a primary reaction. If that particular antigen should ever enter the body again later, a secondary reaction takes place. The body is then able to produce large numbers of corresponding antibodies within a short time, so the invading antigens are quickly wiped out, without the person suffering any harm from the disease. That is the end of section 4. You now have half a minute to check your answers. That is the end of the listening test. You now have 10 minutes to transfer your answers to the listening answer sheet.